Thursday, October 20th, a twin-engine Convair 240 with the name Leonard Skinner painted on the side is 580 miles out of Greenville, South Carolina, bound for Baton Rouge. The 24 passengers aboard are heading for a concert date Friday night. They're relaxing. Some are playing poker. Most musicians at a certain point will sit down and they'll say, you know, is our time coming? I mean, when you fly two and three hundred airplanes a year, you always feel that there's a point when it may catch up with you. It is shortly before six o'clock central daylight time. The pilot, Walter McCreary of Dallas, Texas, radios Houston air traffic control. He's low on fuel and can't make Baton Rouge 80 miles away. Instead, he'll try for a small airport at nearby Macomb, Mississippi. When we found out 10 minutes from the Baton Rouge airport that we ran out of gas, and uh, I just heard the pilot go, oh my god. Pilot McCreary turns his plane to the left and starts back toward Macomb. His altimeter reads 2,000 feet. The time is just past 6 o'clock. One of the engines on the conveyor quits, probably starved for fuel. My wife and I were out sitting in our backyard and we heard this plane come over with, it sounded like it was running on one engine. And uh, then all of a sudden I heard that engine go out. By now, Pilot McCreary is desperately looking for a spot for an emergency landing. He follows a pipeline route. For reasons unknown, McCreary changes his mind and heads for a better spot, a pasture off to his left. The Convair 240 is in a glide, a hundred yards short of the pasture. The wings are clipping treetops. The plane stalls and goes down. A look at Leonard Skinner, a Channel 4 Eyewitness News special report with Tom Wills. Ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Skinner. Hello, I'm Tom Wills. Leonard Skinner's home, of course, was not Alabama, it was Jacksonville, and the group did not become a success overnight. In the beginning, back in the early 1960s, there were no fancy recording studios or gold albums. The group did a lot of their rehearsing right here in this field in Green Cove Springs. The land really meant something. They rehearsed in a little makeshift cabin um, out in Green Cove Springs near a creek. Um, it was hotter than Hades out there, and they called the studio, which was just a little tin cabin, they called it Hell House. Sharon Lawrence is the author of a book called So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star, featuring Leonard Skinner. She has known the boy since 1973. Gary and Alan are a little younger than Ronnie, and they all played baseball together, and one day Gary and Alan said to Ronnie, we think we're going to have a rock band. And instead of laughing, Ronnie said, yes, we are. You're going to play guitars, and I will be the leader. Ronnie Van Zant, Gary Rossington, and Alan Collins did form a band. They called themselves One Percent. And the circuit in those days meant things like high school dances. Well, they were playing local clubs and local concerts. Uh, I can remember them back in 66 and 67 when they were the One Percent and everything. They just really wanted to play bad all the time. Van Zant was lead singer. Rossington and Collins were guitarists. Along the way, they added fellow Floridians Leon Wilkerson, who played bass, and Billy Powell, who played keyboards. Those five, plus guitarist Ed King and drummer Bob Burns, formed the original Leonard Skinner. One of the band's first records was cut in 1970 at a small local studio. They named it Need All My Friends. The 
first contact I actually had with, uh, with their group, uh, I received a call and they asked to permission to use a, a, a picture of my real estate sign on their album cover. And I said, fine, go ahead. And then the second contact I had with them, they came to a concert here in the Coliseum and they asked me if I would introduce them and I, and I agreed to that. In the late 1960s, Leonard Skinner was a phys ed teacher here at Lee High School. This is where he first met Ronnie Van Zant. Students had to wear socks. They had to have their shirt tails in. They had to wear belts. Sideburns couldn't be below the ears. Uh, the back of the hair couldn't touch the collar. And uh, we were asked by the administration to enforce these rules and send uh, people who didn't conform to those rules to the office. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever the case may be, one of the ones I sent down was, was in a band. And, uh, certainly at that time, uh, there, there's, if you'd have called out their name, uh, no way I would have known them. And even later on, uh, uh, if they'd have walked up to me, uh, I wouldn't have known them. But Van Zant remembered Leonard Skinner well enough to make his name famous with a slightly different spelling. It was also here at Lee High School that the group gained something of a reputation as hard-living hell raisers and roughnecks. And it was a reputation that stayed with them on stage, in print, and in their music. Well, I'm a whiskey, a Most of it was highly exaggerated, and of course, when Ronnie would write a song called Whiskey Rock and Roller, people would immediately seize on that instead of the one called, um, you know, a Searching or Ballad of a Simple Man. They were signed um, to a musician who'd started his own label, and he said, gee, there's such colorful characters, you know, I want to build this hard-living image up. So when I first met them, I expected to see the Hell's Angels. I mean, I was shaking, you know. And I found, you know, babies, you know, their idea of a big time was for eight of them to share one bottle of scotch over two days. They didn't have much money for scotch in the early days, but their so-called torture tour in 1975 changed all that. During one 16-week period, the band played 63 concerts in 59 cities, a different city every other day. In one week in April, Leonard Skinner grossed more than $118,000. Lake Charles, Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana, Dallas, Texas, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Houston, Texas, Austin, Texas. Like many rock groups, Leonard Skinner had its share of changing faces. Ed King and Bob Burns left. Artemis Pyle took over on drums. Steve Gaines joined as a fourth guitarist. And three backup singers were added. Leslie Hawkins, Cassie Gaines, and Joe Billingsley. These five joined Van Zant, Rossington, Collins, Powell, and Wilkerson in a band that achieved international fame. Well, I hope you're young. The Leonard Skinner Band was riding high. They had just released a new album, Street Survivors, and set out on a five-month cross-country tour to promote it. They were on their way to a concert at Louisiana State University when disaster happened. We got to spiral down, trying to lose altitude, find a place to land. And I thought he was going to make this field, and at the last minute I saw that it wasn't. Started clipping pine trees. And at that point, I grabbed a blanket and braced myself and put the blanket over my face. All I saw was treetops. I looked out my window. I was in the middle of the airplane on the right wing. I tried to get close to the back of the airplane as possible. But I got in the middle of the airplane on the right wing, and um, all I saw was treetops. And at, at first, it wasn't so bad, but then when it hit the, you know, the middle of the trees, it was horrible. You know, it, was, it was an experience nobody wants to ever experience, never. Pianist Billy Powell, drummer Artemis Pyle, and another passenger managed to climb through a window and go for help. Neighbors who'd heard the crash were among the first rescue workers to arrive. We walked through the woods to the site. And at that time, there was nobody on the site. Well, we started getting them out then, getting the ones that were hurt out, and everybody's out too. 
Under the glare of helicopter floodlights, the 23 victims were pulled one by one from the wreckage, placed on stretchers, and carried 100 yards through dense woods and across a creek to waiting ambulances. They were rushed to Southwest Mississippi Medical Center in Macomb. It took more than an hour to get all the victims to the hospital. Six are dead. 11 are admitted for treatment after receiving emergency care. Eight are flown to two other hospitals in Jackson, Mississippi. One, Drummer Pyle, was treated and released. Okay. By all accounts, the hospital staff handled the disaster well. The head doctor credited countless rehearsals, which he said prepared his people for the real thing. Before dawn the next morning, the hospital had compiled a list of 26 names and notified next of kin. The dead, the pilot and co-pilot. Band leader, Ronnie Van Zant. Guitarist, Steve Gaines. His sister, singer Cassie Gaines. And assistant road manager, Dean Kilpatrick of Jacksonville. The 20 survivors included singer Leslie Hawkins, bass guitarist Leon Wilkerson, guitarist Alan Collins, and guitarist Gary Rossington. Wilkerson and Rossington suffered the most severe injuries. He has two broken arms, a broken leg, a broken pelvis, a punctured stomach, and a punctured liver. And he's going to be in the hospital in Jackson, Mississippi, for about another month. But uh, Leon, Leon's got tremendous amounts of internal injuries, and Alan's got a, a broken, not a broken neck, but a cracked neck. Every airplane crash is methodically investigated by specialists from the National Transportation Safety Board. They look at wreckage as pieces of a puzzle which, when put together, will tell them why a plane crashed. The search at the scene even extends to the passenger's luggage. The board looks into about 4,500 mishaps a year. To the field investigators, wreckage is routine business. But for the rest of us who saw the remains of Leonard Skinner's Convair 240, the sight is unforgettable. You can't even realize, seeing one of these things on television, exactly what a crash of this magnitude looks like. Up there, sitting against the tree, is a piece of an airplane wing torn away from the rest of the airplane. Lying down there at the base of the tree is the engine. And that back there, that twisted metal back there, is the fuselage of the plane, which sort of was turned around a corner. It was just terrible. People are hollering, screaming, and I've never witnessed anything before in my lifetime. It was just a disaster to me. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, it just hit me hard. Nine days have passed since the crash, and the investigation has really only just begun. Authorities still believe the plane ran out of gas. But why? Didn't they put enough gas in the tanks, or was there a leak? We won't know the answers to those questions for at least a month. Gary Rossington and Leon Wilkerson are still hospitalized in the intensive care unit. They could stay there anywhere from two more weeks to a month. Leslie Hawkins has had extensive plastic surgery on her face. Alan Collins is moving around despite a huge plaster cast for his cracked neck. Artemis Pyle is not in the hospital, but friends say he is still not recovered from the shock. What about Leonard Skinner? Will, they, will, there, will there be a Leonard Skinner after this? I don't think so. There's so much love between those people that I can't really imagine them splitting up. Gary Rossington, who was intensive care, looked at his doctor and mumbled, don't worry, I bounce back. And I, I guess you just think, well, you always have, haven't you? Sharon Lawrence said it would not be fair for anyone to try to replace Ronnie Van Zant. At the hospital last Friday morning, Ronnie's father was asked if he was proud of his son. Was I? Indeed. And uh, of course, I knew uh, that he was going to make it. Ten days ago, I knew Leonard Skinner only by their music. Now I feel kind of like I know them personally, not just as celebrities, but simply as people. Yeah, they experienced the, uh, the elation and also the drudgery of being rock stars. And certainly, rehearsing out here in this field, they must have done some sweating as well. Now those who are surviving are also experiencing the pain, not just of their injuries, but also the pain of losing their leader and two other friends. Ronnie Van Zant was more than the lead singer of that band. He was the father of the group. 
Some people in Jacksonville will remember Ronnie differently. They will think of him as the sweet-faced young boy who delivered the newspaper. Ronnie himself, I think, by what his friends say, doubted whether Jacksonville respected him. He said once, I'm shantytown. They'll never care about me here. Of course, those who knew him respected him and loved him. Now I'd like to say a word about those young people who are still lying in the hospitals in Mississippi. They're thinking of Jacksonville, of home, and of their friends. The words of the song are, Lord, I'm tired, and I want to go home. I need all my friends to talk to. Gary Rossington said, tell everybody hello and love, and don't worry about me. Leon Wilkerson, who can only write notes, gave a message to a friend that said, I feel this was a lesson, another step toward a different world that'll be much better. I personally hope that he's right. <laughs>